Hello everyone, I'm Naomi Polonsky, I'm the Assistant Curator at the Newhall Art Collection and I'm delighted to be introducing this talk tonight between two brilliant speakers, Griselda Pollock and Coral Woodbury. I want to thank all of you for attending, it's great to see so many of you here um, and I also want to thank Hackleberry Fine Art for their role in making this event happen. Um, so first of all I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Newhall Art Collection and then introduce our fantastic speakers. Um, so Griselda, if you could load the PowerPoint. Perfect. So for those of you who don't know it, the Newhall Art Collection is a collection of modern and contemporary art by women, the largest collection of its kind in Europe. It's displayed across Murray Edwards College, which is one of the two colleges for women at the University of Cambridge. And the college was founded as Newhall in 1954, at a time when there was only one female student for every seven male students um, at the university. It was originally based in a building in central Cambridge, and then in the early 60s, it moved um, to its current building, um, which is on the... Um, next slide as well. So this is what the building looked like when it first opened. Um, it was designed by Chamberlain, Powell and Bonn who went on to design the Barbican Centre in London and they worked in collaboration with the president of the college, Rosemary Murray, to create this iconic brutalist building which is a kind of manifesto for women's education. Um, next slide please. So there's this feeling of luminosity and ascendance in the building created by the fountain court at the centre of the college, the dome-like dining room and large windows that flood the building with light. An artist who came to paint a portrait of the outgoing president recently said that the dome is our greatest sculpture in the collection, which um, uh, I, I love the sound of that. And you can tell from the early photographs that it had this amazing sculptural, has this amazing sculptural quality. They almost look like abstract sculptures or something. Um, so when they first built the building, there wasn't enough money um, to construct both a library and a chapel. So instead they decided to create a library with the appearance of a chapel, which you can see in the next slide. The central nave and the columns draw on ecclesiastical architecture and were intended to create the sense that women could ascend um, physically and academically through knowledge and learning. Um, at this time in the early 60s, the college owned a few eclectic pieces of art but didn't have any collection to speak of and most of the artworks that they had were by male artists. However, in 1985-1986, the very pioneering feminist artist Mary Kelly um, did a residency at Kettle's Yard and Newhall, um, and the college acquired her work Extaz, which is named after one of the five hysterical postures of women as identified by the 19th century psychiatrist Jean-Martin Charcot, and which explores women's experience during the women's liberation movement. And the acquisition provided a stimulus for the creation of an all-women's art collection. The fellows of the college began to think about the very stark difference in representation between male and female artists in museums and galleries, and the fact that so many art students uh, were female, but such a small proportion of practicing art artists were. Um, the National Gallery still now only has 24 works by women artists out of their collection of 2,391. Um, so they represent about 1% of the collection. Um, and I think tonight um, that's a topic that will be discussed. Um, so the president at the time and Anne Jones, a curator at the Arts Council, set about trying to confront this underrepresentation. Um, and establish an all-women's art collection. And they started compiling lists of women artists um, and sending out letters asking if these artists would be willing to, to donate a work um, to the college. And out of the first 20 artists that they contacted, 19 donated works. So they were emboldened by this um, and carried on um, adding to the list. And also um, the women artists communicated with, recommended one another. So it grew very organically, um, partly sort of through word of mouth. Um, and by 1992, they had received 75 donations, which is an extraordinary act of collecting giving that I think indicates women artists desire to be represented at that time when they were being largely overlooked. 
Today, the collection comprises over 550 works of art, nearly all of which are on display across the college. So in the large public spaces like the dome, but also in student corridors and the library and staff offices. Within Murray Edwards, the collection is a celebration of women's agency and collaboration. More broadly, it's an art historical record and a living and evolving body of art, which demonstrates the breadth and diversity of women's creativity. It tells the story of significant art artistic movements since the 1950s, as reflected in work by women artists, as well as the remarkable narrative of its own establishment and evolution. And at the heart of the founding mission of the collection um, is the principle of collaboration in which women played the roles of artists, collectors, curators and patrons. We normally stage two exhibitions per year, which are accompanied by a public programme of events such as tours, talks, workshops and screenings. Our most recent exhibition was More Soul to the Centre of the Frame, which is on the next slide. Um, Maud Salter was a Scottish Ghanaian artist, poet and curator. Her work, Failure Portrait of Alice Walker, which is in the collection, is part of a series of nine photographic portraits of black women artists, writers, performers and activists who are dressed as the nine Greek muses. And our exhibition brought together six of the nine works from the series. Salter created Zabat in 1989 to commemorate the 150th anniversary of the invention of photography and she called the series a diasporan family portrait and she challenges the invisibility of black women in art history through it. She was one of the first artists to donate to the collection when it was first established and she was a vocal advocate of it in its early history. She also spoke at the opening event in 1992. Another person who spoke at the opening was Griselda Pollock, who has supported and continues to support the collection in so many different ways. I'm going to read a short quote which you said at the opening, Griselda, which I think is so beautiful and which really encapsulates why the collection is such a special place. Um, so Griselda said, the artists in the collection have agreed to come together and through their vibrant and powerful works, form a permanent testimony to the, to the very idea of a community of women. The artists and their work speak as much to each other as to us, the onlookers. Hanging here together, they provide not a dumb spectacle, but a model of conversation. And I love the idea of this model of conversation between artworks and artists. Um, so Griselda Pollock um, is Professor Emerita of Social and Critical Histories of Art um, at the University of Leeds, where she um, lectured from 1977 to 2020. In 2020, she was the laureate of the Holberg Prize, awarded for her lifetime's work on feminism and art histories. She spent five decades developing international, queer, post-colonial, feminist critique of art, art history and analyses of art's diverse histories, which focus on how to deliver feminist interventions um, into art histories. And among her many publications are works like Old Mistresses, Women, Art and Ideology, and Differencing the Canon, Feminist Desire and the Writing of Arts Histories. And tonight, Griselda will be speaking with Coral Woodbury, who is an artist based in New York, although her studio is um, in Rhode Island. Um, she's exhibited nationally and internationally um, and in 2020 she was finalist for the Mother Art Prize. Her practice is rooted in creating visibility for those who have been obscured and left out of history. She describes herself as a historian gazing backward and uh, as an artist creating anew. Um, in her recent series revised edition, Coral recreates the history of art from a feminist perspective. She paints portraits of women artists over pages from canonical works of art history, which as we know are very male dominated. So she writes a historic wrong. Um, and Griselda and Coral will be talking about some of the reasons behind these omissions in art history, as well as about Coral's practice and process of creating work. Um, there'll be some time after the in conversation for questions, so please do um, post your questions in the Q and A box. And I'll now hand over to Griselda. Thank you so very much, Naomi, um, and welcome to everybody. Um, it's strange not to have faces to see, but I know that there are people with us, and we thank you for joining us. 
Um, it's my incredible and deep pleasure to be here even virtually today with Coral Woodbury, whose work, thanks to Sasha Heckel of the Hackel, sorry, of the Hackelbury um, Gallery, I have only recently come to know. We are here to discuss her project, um, Revised Edition, which is part of the exhibition currently on show. And I'm going to share my screen again at the, um, the gallery uh, called Palimpsest. And we're here to discuss the project, which hints at her relation to Revised Edition to books and indeed to, to a certain book, as we shall soon find out which book is the crucial one, and to the idea of revisions, to challenges, to layerings, to overlays. Her work, she's told me, and is clearly here in the title, um, is fascinated by the notion of the palimpsest, this layering that was characteristic of manuscripts when people wrote on parchment and on leather, where they had to reuse it, and we find uh, in pre-paper and pre-printing era, when traces of the past and new presence joined and hid each other and layered time in different kinds of conversations. So I think this is a crucial point. Now we can talk about the big issues, but the most important thing when you're actually encountering the work of art is to look at the work uh, of the artist in question. And we have here uh, in installation shots of the exhibition Palimpsest at the Hackleberry Fine Art, which some of us not ha have not had the chance to see. And you can see that it's composed of a series of uh, images, paintings, uh, which are painted on something, which form um, conversations in different ways. And that you will see that over and over and over again, we may see a woman's face coming forward from the page, see some elements of the printing, and looking at us, looking towards us. So we end up with a wonderful um, and consistent community of women. Uh, we talked about it when we were talking earlier, Coral and I, we thought, what is the word? Is it an orchestra of women? Is it a community of women? Is it a, like, as well as some of her works and some of the cases in a show that she had at her other gallery, Abigail Ogilvie Gallery, um, in, in the United States, uh, they mounted it in this way unframed as a kind of wall, uh, a massed sort of not a phalanx in the military sense, but that's why I call the notion of an orchestra of women. And there are a couple of very powerful things we need to think about in terms of what we are looking at. And the first question when you meet an artist or artwork is ask what we're looking at. So I'm going to ask Coral now if she would introduce her, say hello to you as well and come in, but maybe talk us through a couple of works she's chosen just to give you a sense of what she has done, how she has made it and what her practice is like. But before she starts this, I'm going to ask her if she would tell us a story about an exhibition she went to see quite recently and why she went and how it relates to what she's doing in this work. So I'm going to stop sharing here and give you the stage as it were, Coral. Hi there. Hi, thank you, Griselda. Um, right before Griselda and I spoke last week, uh, the day before I had taken myself on a, on a day trip. It's one of the privileges of being an artist is that I get to go to museums and call it work. So uh, Hartford is about two hours from where I live and um, I made myself the journey to go see the exhibition at the Wadsworth Athenaeum, by her hand, women artists in Italy, uh, 1500 to 1800. And um, I, didn't, I didn't look ahead of time to know what I was going to be seeing. I was not, not one of those massive blockbuster exhibitions. It was really a, a large, just one large room, um, but you know, a room of wonder and um, you know, I walked in and I started looking around and I turned the corner and uh, actually I saw, there's a, a painting by Sophonis by Andy Sola. <clears throat> I didn't expect to see it and I kind of turned around the partition. So that uh, painting of who we believe is her sister Elena who became um, Sister Minerva when, uh, when she joined the nunnery. And I was just so, 
delighted to see her, sort of surprised and delighted. It was like greeting a friend and I just wanted to give her a hug, which is wholly inappropriate in a museum. But um, as, a, as a former museum professional, my graduate degree is in museum studies and I already know that I'm, I'm one of those museum visitors who's troublesome. I'm constantly having to be told to back away from the paintings because I just want to see how the brush strokes are made and um, the glazes and the colors and everything. But, you know, it was such a wonderful experience. It was all so being surrounded by all of these women in dialogue with each other. And even though they, they may have lived across uh, a few centuries, they were all in conversation and I had uh, the joy of well, quite literally, I imagine these conversations in my head and ask, ask of them. And so really marvelous and inspiring. Roach, because I was very moved by that story in terms of, again, the sense that we have um, as women, when we go to museums with our little, you know, feminist antennae, you know, we're looking, is there going to be anything by a woman, you know, and then you come across it or you travel special distances, you know, there's a Sophonis of Angusola, maybe, at, you know, Spencer, um, the, what's her name, Diana Spencer's, the Princess Diana's family home, etc. And, you know, so I had to persuade somebody, you know, wouldn't you like to go and see this, you know, lovely, you know, house and, you know, went around this house and of course in the dingy interior of an old country house, you suddenly come across it and it's a, it's that moment. And why did we feel like this? Why is it so important for us to have these contacts? And I thought what you're saying about you're doing this research and how, you know, now we sometimes get these exhibitions, we get a chance to see these works for them to be brought together as opposed to the one in the basement and the one on, up in the roof. So um, this, this seemed to me to, to be a way into sort of thinking very much about in a sense, what you are trying to do. So what we'd like to do now is to talk about what you actually do, because as I say, what the practice is, what are we looking at? How are they made? Could you tell us a little bit? So let's go and visit your studio, which we can see behind you. I will go back into my, um, to share. And I wonder if you could just talk us through what, what is this that we're looking at when we look at this image, which is titled Selma Burke, Sumi Inc on book page. Well, I suppose it might be time to reveal what book page it is. Um, Janssen's History of Art, uh, up until 1986, left out all the women, absolutely all of them. Here's, here's my copy. And it's starting to fall apart because what I've been doing is, hmm, there goes another, uh, tearing out the, the pages and reinstating the women in the art history. Uh, so it's, it's a research project and then uh, it is, it is an art project and out of 617 pages, I thought I was a little closer to half, but when I did the math, I've done 120. Um, so another 188 to go. And then the, all the versos. So it will be a really large body of work in the end. Um, but one at a time, it is, finding the woman, the artist that uh, I wish to draw. So that's really the start of it is who, who, who to draw. And, uh, and then I need to find what page she belongs on. So that also is, is part of the process, is fitting, fitting the woman to the page in, in the textbook flipping through back and forth and back and forth. And then uh, sketching her up on the page with one of my turquoise, soft turquoise pencils. I can't, you can't buy these anymore. Well, you can, but not by the same maker. So I actually buy vintage pencils on eBay. Uh, so they have the nice buttery quality to them. And, uh, and then the next, here, I will, just yesterday, Griselda, you sent me um, Joanne Leonard's work. And so I, I don't know if you can see this here. I, mm, no, not, pro, not on my little window. It's okay, we can see something. Yep. It, okay. 
bit pixelated from my view, but I drew up Joanne Leonard on um, on the page. I I selected to draw her over John Fuseli's uh, The Nightmare because of her Dreams and Nightmares series. So I always try to make some kind of link with, with the page, um, whether it's uh, some, some thematic link with their own work or sort of art historic, historically uh, or a, 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 biographical, a biographical connection. And then, and then comes the, the inking phase. Um, I don't know if I can, I can show you my, I, I use either a liquid sumi ink or uh, an ink stick. Mm -hmm. And my beautiful old uh, ink stone, soap stone. And you use that, actually, you put a few drops of water on here and then rub and rub and rub and rub and make your ink and you can use that. Um, I often use this as a palette so I can see the gradations of ink, how dark and how light, how much more water I need to add. And I tend to use my ink stone as a way to kind of dry my brush a bit. So, um, I can kind of keep wiping off extra liquid and, and bring back its point. And I do use traditional bamboo uh, sumi ink brushes of varying sizes. Um, There's a wonderful sense of the, the movement of the brush with the ink that's almost calligraphic as we, we see these images. So let me go back and see um, what we've got here again. Um, so you're also choosing very carefully to compose something on the page so that there's a drawing underneath, then there's inking uh, that gives you, so there's a, a certain kind of movement, and then there's the, the, the flow of it. And then we, you're also composing. So perhaps you could say something about your choices in composing Augusta Savage and tell us a little bit also about who the artist is, what have you learned and why you put this combination together. Um, there, there really is a sense in the process of making these of, of fine, that actually is one of those really time intensive aspects of this is trying to fit them on the page because I'm already working. It's not the same as working on a blank canvas. There's already a composition. There's already light and dark. There's already the texture of the text and the tonal qualities. Um, and so as in the process of looking through the book, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for something that really, really connects. And sometimes I just can see how that, that works and can um, work the image that I've chosen. And I always um, really aim to find images where the artist is making eye contact. That's a really a vital part of the, the drawing for me. Um, and, and then um, seeing how that, the image that I'm working from, how that might, how the contours of her hair or um, hat or um, facial structure or the curve of the cheek or neckline, how any of that might play in and, and be echoed or be um, sort of expanded upon a bit by, by the qualities of the artwork that are already on the page. And so uh, Augusta Savage was a, a sculptor and an American sculptor. And uh, I wanted to, to place her amongst some of this really beautiful and um, you know, historically recognized sculpture and you know, pair her where she belonged with it. And it, and uh, the, the winged Samothrace, uh, Nike, the way her, her wings sort of carried the line of the hair and the relief as well, we've expanded that, so. 
That's that's lovely. Let me just go on here with um, this one, which is Gwendolyn Knight. Can you tell us a bit about Gwendolyn Knight and why you chose her um, and how you fitted her into this particular framework? Well, she actually, we have a little sequence of, of artists here. Uh, Gwendolyn Knight uh, studied with Augusta Savage, the previous artist, so very often the one artist will lead me to the next. And I thought that uh, Gwendolyn's, that three quarter turn of her face, and it was so leonine. And so I, I paired her with the, uh, I'm pointing to it on my screen, which you can't see, but the, the lion's face and, uh, Yeah. But there's a similar power in, in both their faces and, and the expressions of those. Can we go back to um, sorry. Selma Park? Yep, sorry, I was going that to. Makes a, that makes a kind of the sequence. Sequence there. Uh, Selma Burke uh, was an American sculptor from North Carolina and her first encounter with sculpture was squeezing the, the clay through her fingers. And she said that's what, that was when, you know, as a girl, she, she discovered herself. That was her first sculpture experience. And that was where she, she recognized or discovered herself. And she became a key figure in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and if you were in, an American audience, I would have you root around in your purses or your pockets and see if you could come up with a, a dime. But this, if you see that the dime, you get the light to hit it, I don't know. That is, um, that is FDR on our dime, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it is based on, or is from um, her own relief of, of FDR, so. There she was all the time. There she was on every time. And all the time in our pockets and I had no idea. So now I'm always, I always greet her when a dime crosses my palm, so. Okay, let's just look at one more uh, um, that here that you put in the sequence. So we've got Selma Burke, uh, Augusta Savage, you know, it's obviously also from the 1930s and your image there is that she goes to Paris. So she also is part of this African-American kind of claiming of Paris. There's a wonderful set of research about in a sense black Paris post-war with the Josephine Baker and a whole other group who come to it. And then Gwendolyn Knight is a student of Augusta Savage's presumably up in the um, art schools in Harlem. Mm -hmm. and, and then, but then we have, you've also, we also chose as one of the ways into this to look at the Paula Modison Becker, which is really interesting because it's not on a page associated with the 1900s, the period or the sort of the 1900 to 196 or seven, which is the period of her activity. Sorry, go back and one, one, go back a bit. Um, but all, but you've, you've made this connection with the Willendorf figurine and this lovely, um, also other sort of Paleolithic piece of the, the carved uh, cow. So, or maybe it's a ball, I don't know. Um, do you want to say something about um, this piece for us? And then we'll move on to the context. Sure. Um, well, Modersen Becker, you know, it was, um, I paired her on this page because of sort of stories and mythologies around the, the Willendorf figurine uh, which has been taught as a, a fertility figure. And um, Paula Modersen Becker's, the biographical story that we have from her, you know, entirely, well, not apart from her artwork, but in addition to her, her artwork, um, is I think it's just a really powerful story about the experience of women and their struggles. Uh, to to become artists, she it was she was so committed to 
becoming an artist. She left her husband in Germany and also traveled to learn and study and paint in Paris, was committed to, to her career as an artist and, and struggled with the societal expectations around marriage and around uh, having children. Um, she, she became quite successful and eventually returned to her husband uh, and became pregnant and then um, died uh, from a postpartum embolism on, within three weeks of giving birth. So it's a really, her last words when she, when she was getting up, reaching for her, her newborn were, what a pity. And we, in our history, we so often will read the biographical facts without really letting that in, you know, letting a story like that in. Um, also just remarkable as a, as a painter and invented sort of the new, the female nude in the first female nude painted by a woman in, in modern art and also uh, the female nude, her own self portrait as a pregnant woman before she was even pregnant. So a really revolutionary artist and I, I wish yeah. we had more of her work. Exactly. It's one of the great tragedies, not knowing, not allowing her to have had a full career that she could do. So we've got a sense of the, the composition, the decision, the kind of level of research, the kind of associates, because it's not just about adding a name. This is really thinking through the relationships between the lives and works of these artists and a history of art that you're kind of taking from Janssen and making them these images do something very different. So what I'd like to do is to sort of um, move on. I'm, I know you wanted us to mention Anna Coleman Ladd and I, I understand the, the she's part of a group in the States but also there's a whole group of women sculptors in Paris that Claudine Mitchell is a very famous feminist art historian in, in, on this side of the pond, uh, who used their sculptural skills to create prostheses to rebuild the, the faces of the men who had horrific facial injuries, injuries in the war. And it's a very interesting group of artists who turned their skills to, to this. Um, so I, I suggest people look into her I hope you don't mind if I kind of move on a little bit because I think you know, time is coming on because I think we need to talk a bit about the book that you're working from and why what you're doing with this creation of these women looking out from these pages and conversing with the whole glory of the history of art. Um, what's the book and who was not paying attention at the time? So excuse me if I go a little bit into my kind of academic mode here, but the book that you're dealing with is Horst Voldemar Janssen, 1913 to 1982, actually, I've cut off the two, wrote a book called History of Art. So here is all of History of Art, everything you need to know, all in one book. And you can see by this library thing that many college libraries have five, six, seven, eight things because it is the basic textbook that is used in particular United States, but it's gone uh, through, sorry, we'll go through several things. So it's a survey of the major visual arts and the dawn of history to the present. You don't need any other book. Uh, there are revised editions. Uh, it's in 24, what does it say here? 15 languages. Here's German, here's the Italian version. Um, and then it's revised and expanded. We're now in the eighth or 16th even edition. Uh, Four million copies have been sold. So this is, absolutely defining book in the, not just the English language, for getting a single survey history of art. But it's a purely stylistic history. It's completely without purpose, uh, social history. It has no interpretation of the works. It's just tracking stylistic developments and changes. It also is trying to teach you the skills of the connoisseur to be able to discern them. And it is wanting you to love art. So it's really trying to you know, seduce people into loving art. So it's about the great monuments. And that's why key monuments in the history of art, great masters. There is no space in this for the kinds of things that you've been talking about, which make these women so interesting. They're very 
complex relationships to race, to class, to gender, to the, the experience of the body, to life and death, to sexuality, that's not going to be in Janssen at all. Now, in um, 1985 or six, his son, just after the death of, 19, of Janssen, decided that it needed a little bit of revision. And he was going to include things which his father had not liked, which was much more to do with contemporary art, modern art, contemporary art, and included photography, which is why I mentioned and introduced you to yet another artist for you to bring, the wonderful Joanne Leonard, uh, contemporary British, um, American um, photographer, whose work, Romanticism is Ultimately Fatal, is one of the first illustrations in the new revised edition. But there were very, very few women, uh, but this has changed slightly. Now, I want to put that in the context of the sort of history, because you were born in the year that Linda Nochlin published her famous article in Art News, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? Now we can understand she's talking to Janssen, who since 1962 is peddling the great masters version of art history, right? And She's not just saying, why have there been no women artists? She's saying, why have there been no great ones? Because that's the term, great masters. So I think she's in conversation with Janssen. But then we have an exhibition called Old Mistresses, Women Artists of the Past, very like your By Your Hand that you saw in Hartford at uh, the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, which shows us there's you know, medieval women artists, Italian Renaissance, all of these were found in the basements or collections of American museums and brought together. Our Hidden Heritage, Five Centuries of Women Artists, 1974. 1978, Elsa Honig finds Women in Art. 1979, Germaine Greer's, you know, by the end of the 70s, there's no doubt we have now really documented women artists very easily. They were all there to be found. It didn't take a great deal of work. Archives, dictionaries, 19th century books, 18th century books, these artists were known, so they were not forgotten, they were made invisible by Janssen and his colleagues in the 20th century. And then inspired by the Walters Art Gallery, Rosie Parker and I did Old Mistresses. On the cover of Old Mistresses in Britain, we put Marisol Escobar, a, a Venezuelan artist of color who was then living in New York. Um, the Americans didn't get this, so the public, the, American version didn't have this on. And then we've kept trying to bring this idea that women artists are right now, they're living in the 20th century. They're not just old mistresses. This is uh, Marit Oppenheim, obviously, the only woman to have a work in the Museum of Modern Art for a very long time. And then we've begun to have to discover more and more women artists. This is a wonderful Anna Bogdanovich Belinska, who was a Polish artist who also died very, very young, very tragically after only six years of painting. But I just love this, this pose. I just thought it had to be there. So in that context, we suddenly have a whole world of women. This is my kind of chorus of women uh, that were wherever we looked. And many of them are you know, taken up by you in, in your, your painting. Now, when we put the two things together, the Janssen and this generations of people who've been done their first year art history courses or their love of art courses or their fine, all got a completely all white, all male, all great, all stylistic history. And we, what we're really trying to do is not to recover women artists, but to really make it clear to people that this is a very serious, damaging, of the psyches of women and of the valuing of women in culture. If no woman has ever done anything worth remembering, women really are not important in the history of the world. So I was asking you to think about these two questions and we'll go back to your work in a minute so you can talk a bit through that. What does not seeing or knowing any artist women, and you know, I don't talk about women artists, there are artist women, there are artist men. It's not just artists and women artists, it's very important language. So what does not seeing or knowing any artist women do to the creativity of women? What did it do to your psyche as a young student in you know, 20 years after you know, Linda Nochlin and what you're getting is Janssen, this loneliness of the solitary woman in a world only populated, you know, the museum only populated by men. 
And then what does, what does knowing and being accompanied by artist women do for artist women? So that's why I wanted to start with your story of feeling Sofonisba, you know, Anguissola Rot, Misa Gentileschi around you as your companions in your project. So what does that knowing and being accompanied do for the artist women like you, but for all of us and for what, how we then value women in culture and society even if we're not personally engaged in art making, it matters to us all to have women as objects of significance and value in the history of humanity. So let's go back and pick up on Sophonisba Anguissola, as you mentioned her. You've done some of your, your um, palimpsestic overlays of and speaking back to Janssen on the color plate. So could you tell us a little bit here because this is a different um, technique. And also, you've actually used this wonderfully powerful element of Sophonisba Anguissola's direct gazes. These women always gaze at us, it's so powerful. But you've put it over Michelangelo's, um, not the creation of Adam, which is just next door to this, but the scene of the expulsion of Adam and Eve after Eve has eaten the fruit from the garden. So you, you really put these two together. So maybe you could talk a bit about the process and then why, how you made this decision. Uh, well, the color plates in the textbook, I'm using a different kind of ink. And so it, I, I soon discovered that it resists the Sumi ink. Sumi ink just beads up on it and I can't draw on it. So I had to find another method uh, to draw upon the color plates. And so what I do is um, paint on a transparent, it's like a treated, it's like mylar. Uh, it's a treat water treated so that it will receive water media. So that's the, the only time I sort of have a blank canvas in a way, uh, work against a white sheet of paper behind it. And then there's the magical moment of laying it over the color plate and shifting it around um, so that it, it just aligns exactly as uh, to the and best quality. So there, there is obviously a lovely link because um, Angus, Sophie Angusola's father sent a drawing to Michelangelo who Encourage the little uh, one of these beautiful little drawings of hers, and actually he approved that. And it was possibly through Michelangelo receiving that that Vasari then went to visit Sophonisba Angusola, and she appears therefore in his first big biography of artists. Um, sorry, I'm going to. That's um, I'm maybe am I not sharing? I wasn't sharing that picture. I was just staring it to myself. I'm so sorry to everybody. You now can see what we were talking about. Here is Sophonisba Angusola. Uh, on that score. So now let's just move on to another one. Um, here you've juxtaposed Harriet Becker in relation to one of the kind of classic objects of feminist exploration, the, 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 the Greek nude with her, as it were, um, hidden pudenda and her absent body, you know, absent, you know, genitals, in fact, in these works. Um, this Another one here we've got, and maybe you could talk another one in color of Camille Claudel. Um, how, what have, what have you superimposed her on and what is it that you were trying to do in this particular image? Uh, I have superimposed her on the uh, Greek Kore uh, figure and uh, it really it was a matter of selecting selecting her, a magnificent sculptor in her own right, and um, equating her with, with the, the value we place in classical, in classical sculpture. Okay, that's it, okay. This one's drawn a lot of attention because you've taken the, um, the modernist Victoria uh, Vanessa Bell, but in one of her kind of looking more like a Victorian always with this wonderful great hat, but then she lies over um, the, um, the this, this is the Ghent altarpiece. You've 
managed to get something of the flow of the hat and the decoration there. But again, the eyes speak back to us. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about this, about Hil Hilma Afklimt, because Hil Hilma Afklimt has only kind of come back into view, partly through um, Catherine de Sega, which who did an exhibition uh, of three times abstraction and looked at this inventor of abstraction who's never been credited before. It was always Kandinsky and the others. But here you've laid her over um, a medieval manuscript. Uh, I chose this particular page um, because it brought together both the, the abstract qualities and the spiritual qualities. Um, and again, you keep pointing out that, that I, in, in every instance that I'm able, there are some where I can't find images to work from, but that the, the artist is looking out making direct eye contact. And that's, that's important on a couple levels. So, um, one, it's important for, for me to connect with them. I always, usually in a, in a sketch or a drawing, you don't start with one part and then move on to the next. It's really sort of an all over construction that, that emerges simultaneously. But with these drawings, I always start with the eyes. I need to see who this woman is. So I need to make that kind of connection. But then when you have a wall uh, of women looking at you, unified, they have this, this sense of defiance. Um, and uh, perhaps anger, perhaps just defiance. And I think that that's a really that's a really important part of this of this work. Okay, let's see. So um, I'm going to make a little sort of statement here because you see, I, I think a lot of the literature I read sort of as if you are, you know, expanding, uh, correcting, and we're always seen to be sort of rediscovering forgotten women artists and trying to reinsert them. But I I see what you're doing as a really major feminist intervention which is always the terms I always want to do, shattering the, you know, the history of art, this monocular white masculinized history of art with these layerings, these palimpsestics layering of artist women who've always been there and in conversation with all of the art. So you've, that's why I think is an important feeling of what you've done. So now they look back from the very pages where they were consciously dis disappeared and then inter interrogate us now to say, who, do you know who I am? You know, do you not want to find out who I am? So I think this is the sense of the research that you do, the compositioning that you do, and then the performance of this act of engagement and, and kind of um, not kind of, you know, in sort of dialogue with the women, you are populating your world as well as ours uh, at these very, very complex works. So I want to look at a few more, a little bit more things. Um, You've also wanted very, worked very hard to be inclusive in our language now, because we can easily have, even as my early slide showed, you can have a lot of white women. You can have no quest, you can have it in such a way that the only thing called, that they're called women artists, but women are women in various different ways, right? Uh, you know, and particularly queer artists. And I, I, I've written a lot about Gluck, I, I'm absolutely, fascinated with the photographs that she had taken of herself in her beautifully tailored suits and that moment of how women were dis exploring a kind of self-fashioning of a different kind of queer subjectivity or in her terms lesbian subjectivity as an artist at that time but also you've introduced Lotta Lazerstein that I know um, one of the people who may be listening the wonderful um, art, uh, cultural analyst Brenda Holweg and what brought this to my attention, this extraordinary uh, German artist, very, very powerful German artist. Um, and you've brought them together in, in different ways, exploring different kinds of femininity. And then we've got um, sculptors. And I, I love the way you talked about Augusta Savage, but also in the Louise Bourgeois, you have this wonderfully wicked quality in, you know, in Louise Bourgeois's way of looking at the world, etc. but you've placed her in relation to Carpo's The Dance, to something which is one of these, you know, um, 
19th century, it's actually from the opera, it's a decoration of the opera, which was absolutely outrageous as a sculpture, sculpture because the man or the nymph, not the nymph, the satyr holding the dancing nymph, his hands actually press into her flesh. And this was seen to be um, shocking as opposed to the closed body. And I think it you know, relates to Louise Bourgeois sort of bringing back the kind of, the sense of the body into sculpture. So those are a couple of things that I wanted to talk about there. Um, you introduce Nancy Elizabeth Prophet in relation to um, early images of sort of early 20th century masculine images. I'm moving on a little quickly. You also have brought in and done work with Ruth Asawa. Could you tell us a little bit about Ruth Asawa and this image? Uh, Ruth Asawa is another wonderful uh, mid-century American sculptor uh, whose work really was changed by the, the Mexican basket weavers that she saw working and she modified that technique and used wire. It created these just incredible, incredibly shaped, suspended, open basket forms, very organic. Um, and she also raised four children. So there are photos of her working, working this wire suspended forms with her kids playing all around her. And um, that's a really sort of a, a hopeful image. And... Uh, okay, I, I put these two together. You, we, we sort of chose them. Obviously, um, Helen Frankenthaler and Lee Krasner, the 1950s have been uh, artists of the 1950s have been companions of mine when we knew very few you know, these were some of the first because they were still there and working and they were in the news, etc. And Alma Thomas, who is an African-American, a contemporary, slightly younger <coughs> contemporary of Helen Frankenthal is also an abstract painter, but not recognized to the same degree. She lived in Washington, not New York. For many years, she was a teacher. Only when she retired from teaching did she have the full time and space to, to be an artist. But we've recently had some wonderful books which reveal her to be an exquisite abstract you know, color painter in a completely different way uh, from the Frankenthalers and the, the New York action painters. But you've put her here with um, almost with, um, you know, uh, where are these jugs from? These are. Uh, Cretan, some very, but again, pattern, the history of abstraction that some people called craft, but now obviously a very crucial thing to sort of cross those lines. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a nice juxtaposition. Um, and I love this uh, image of Carrie Mae Weems uh, set against Guernica. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that choice. Oh, um, I think because, because of the issues that uh, Karen May Wings is exploring in her art, um, there, there was for me an echo with Veronica and um, sort of looking at, at tragedies and, and uh, social, the social structures that created them. Yeah. Because I think it's, again, going back to what we were saying about Janssen, in, if you do a Janssen history of art, you wouldn't use the word trauma. You would, you know, Picasso's composition, but not in a sense that this is, um, a, a, you know, what ultimately became a communist artist, a very left-wing artist, one passionately anti-fascist. And Carrie Mae Weems is working through the question of black subjectivity uh, for herself, but also in a sense condemning the rest of the um, the history of the enslavement and trauma that was inflicted on Africans. And I just wanted to kind of relate this to the wonderful piece that I think your work is in conversation with called the Museum Studies, where Karen May Williams did this photographic system where she would stand outside the great museums of the world, like the Louvre, 
um, and this is the British Museum, um, and this is obviously Guggenheim Bilbao, um, and this is uh, in is Spain, the one the one down there, etc., and um, the National Gallery, and say in basically placing her black woman saying, why am I not in those collections? So not only are we struggling with the question of what's in or not in the books, but also even at, you know, this is in 2002, they're not collecting them so that the public isn't seeing them. The young black children, the young queer children, the young women are not going into museums and finding them people like themselves there as creative people. This is the damage that it's constantly doing, draining away the possibility of self-identifying as, as an artist. And I, I think this work is a really critical work there. And then I just put in Marisol because as I say, when we put Marisol on the cover of Old Mistresses, um, the American editor said, you know, who is this woman? And when Marisol died quite recently, about, well, not recently, about five or 10 years ago, um, all the headlines said, you know, you know, one of the great pop artists rediscovered, long forgotten. So the thing is women can be there in the 20th century and disappear in their own lifetimes or within five or 10 years. So this is not just a matter of a one-off and why your work I think is, is so important. I, I think we could go back then to these questions. Maybe could you just say before we open up for comments and questions from our audience, um, if you could think about these two questions, I'm going to stop sharing now so you can speak to them about what it's done for you to do this project, to do the research because you didn't know. So what was it like not to know? And then what is it like to have made these incredible community of women around you. So maybe you could talk a little bit about being a student and what it was like to study even in the 1990s and not be taught anything about any women. What I, I look back and it, it's sort of sad, but it, I, I didn't even notice that there weren't women in a way. It was just the fact. It was just, this is art history. And I think there's something about that that just kind of stymies and starves the, the creative impulse um, for, for women to not see themselves reflected back. Um, and it was, it was really at a point where I was looking, you know, trying to find my way forward as an artist that I started to ask, well, what have other women done? And where are they? And who are they? Um, and that was really the, the seed for this, for this project. And um, it's, it's been a very nourishing and inspiring journey to, to get to know all these women. I really feel like I'm filling my studio space with them and, um, because you, you said to me when we were talking that in order to do the drawings, you get to you have to do research into their histories and their practices. So these are not just simply transcriptions of faces. There's something else, as I've tried to point out with people, that because of the way you compose it, where you put them in conversation with how you situate um, the gaze that comes back, that behind that lies a whole discovery of these complex women's lives, their social commitments, their, um, you know, their, their artistic commitments, their travels, their engagement, the communities they belong in. And that's what we miss because it's, I keep trying to say to people, it's not a matter of having some names. It's the worlds that each name bring with them. And each time that name brings a world, it's a bigger world as opposed to this very, very narrow, very selective world. It's not just that Janssen represents just white men. It's not enough to condemn that work for that. It's the impoverishment of the whole sense of history. And I think that's what I found when talking to you, this sense of what the journey was and what it'll be like to, to be with these women when you get 600 and 17 of them all there, what kind of monumental artwork you have created. 
So I don't know if you have any last, you know, suggestions, last thoughts that you'd like to add before we invite people to, um, to be in more conversation with you directly. Well, um, I, if, I think probably everybody gathered here uh, believes that, that art matters, that art is important. And it's a reflection of our value system. And if we aren't seeing ourselves, we aren't seeing our lived, lived experiences reflected back at us from museum walls and galleries and art history textbooks and skyrocketing auction sales, it, you know, it, it tells us we don't belong. And that belonging is, is, is the basis of, you know, it comes right above food and water and physical safety if you're considering the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's, it, that belonging is the foundation for everything else that we can become. Um, and so it's not just about art history, it's about art now. It's, you know, art itself, it's not just an impoverished art history, it's an impoverished present art when there's, there's when you lose the synergy, synergy of a kind of, of a dialogue of mutuality that's inclusive and diverse, but it also impoverishes our future. You know, we can affect, you know, meaningful transformation in the, in the culture that we create now. So I guess that's some of the, the underpinnings of why I'm doing this work. Okay, so I'd like to bring Naomi back as our, our, our chair and things because we now would like to see if people would like to comment or ask any questions. Um, so hand back to you, Naomi. Great, thank you so much for that fascinating discussion. And yes, I'd just like to encourage people to post questions in the Q&A box. We already have um, <coughs> some coming in. So um, one question that we have, um, <coughs> said that um, they really appreciate the context and um, and how that's been kind of applied in the artwork, um, and they're saying that artists, women working with feminist issues, tend to be very focused on shock value um, and how the piece is presented to convey the message. Um, so the question is, Coral, do you use shock in a different kind of way as a way of kind of exposing? Um, absences, omissions um, in Janssen's history? And is this um, a kind of exposure um, of Janssen? Question. I wonder if there's shock in sort of tearing, physically tearing apart uh, what's been called the art history Bible. Um, I, my, I don't, seek to shock in each individual image I'm making. That isn't the goal, but, but I do hope that there is something with the effect of, of a shock maybe in the end or, or something startling about the fact that all of these women, all of these women, and so many, many more, I could never fit them all in, have been there all along, all the time. Yeah. So another question is about um, how you find the images of these women artists. What's your, um, what source material are you using to find that perfect image of a woman to, um, to superimpose onto the text? Well, I'm afraid this is kind of a boring answer. I'm <laughs> not doing a lot of primary research uh, at this point, although there are some artists I hope to be able to find images of that I can't online, but everything is, is online searches at this point. But it, that makes sense in this, in this age. And I, with, I would be um, spending so much more time trying to find images than I would be making images. Yeah. Totally. So there's, there's a... I just say something, Naomi, about that, because I think it's really important. The enormous amount, which is why I put up Elsa Honigstein and um, Eleanor Tufts and Linda Nottlin and all of the enormous amount of work that feminist art historians have done to 
joke two things and it wasn't difficult i keep stressing all we had to do was to go back to the beginning of the 20th century the last great dictionary of women artists was published in about i can't remember the date, but 1905 or something like that which had th a thousand right and i was saying to to um coral on sofa nispa anguissola there's been finally big exhibition in in madrid and now there's going to be another one in things and somebody called michael cole has actually collected all the works attributed to Sophonisba Angusola. And if you look at the provenance of all, about 100 works, not all of them are accepted. But this means from the beginning of when people tried to say, who did this work? Like in the 19th century, when people were trying to put names to these old master paintings, old mistress paintings, her name comes up consistently. So there's about 100 works that somebody thought, oh, that might be an Anguissola. But by the mid 20th century, who had ever heard of Anguissola, right? But the 19th century had, the 18th century had, the 17th century had, and the 16th century certainly had. So this is very crucial for people to understand. This isn't shock and against it. This is just being historically accurate. There have always been women artists and they are there to be found anywhere you look. It took a whole lot of, um, republishing right but you just go back to the 19th century and everybody takes for granted they're women artists women artists of the world big pub book book written in german in 1859 it's not difficult so we have to ask why in the 20th century with the jansons and the gombriches did they decide it was not possible to accommodate women even as everywhere you would go to look for the new artists of the 20th century, you would find men and women, straight and queer, black and white, side by side in their impoverished little flats and apartments and the bateau le bois and everything. They were co-creating modernism. But so there's more women, more visible in the 20th century and art history in the 20th century made none of them visible. And I just want to say feminist artists do not go for shock tactics. They are very deep, thoughtful, creative people. And that's why, you know, Coral's work is not different from feminist art because it's not shocking. It's the same sense of how do you think this through artistically to get you to work out the significance of what this, this is. So when you think about the shock, I was sort of thinking, you know, this is an honor of Hannah Hoch. This is the whole history of palimpsest and collage and overlay and linkage. That's why I started with that, which is so where these layerings help us to get what's going on without it sort of being a single nugget you can extract. So, sorry about that. long talk. No, that's great. I mean, I think what's shocking in and of itself is this uh, the, these gaps in our history of art you don't even need to resort to shock tactics um to kind of create a sense of shock about that i would say um so another question that we have is about what comes first um in your process of creating these works whether it's um, Janssen who provokes the questions for you or your knowledge and respect for these um, artist women um, and and I think the question is also asking who the first um, in portrait was of which artist uh, Janssen's doesn't come first it's it's Janssen's wasn't the impetus for the project it starts with my curiosity, really, uh, wanting to know the women artists and, um, and how I choose who I'm going to work with is really pretty organic. Um, you know, it's, there's not really a system. It's, it's more intuitive and, um, so it starts with that, and then I try to figure out where they, where they fit in the, the textbook that I have. Which is getting harder and harder because I have a lot of architecture pages remaining. Um, and the first one I believe was Georgia O'Keeffe. 
first when I found out there weren't women artists. I think it was George O'Keefe first and Berta Morisot and Mary, I don't know, just like, I could not believe, there's the shock. I could not believe that they were not in the textbook only a couple years before I went to school. So that's, that's where that started. Griselle, did you have anything to add to that? Just to remind people, which is Mary Cassatt died in 1927, which is one year after Monet died, having been part of the first egalitarian modern art movement, which was the Impressionist express, you know, exhibiting society was egalitarian. And there were four women associated with it, two absolutely central to it, one of whom was Mary Cassatt. And by 1946, when John Revelt wrote the first documentary history of Impressionism based only on documents and on Durand Ruel, who was the gallerist's sort of inventories, she was just a, a pupil of Degas. That's what I'm trying to get at. She just is there. You know, the documents are there, the evidence is there, and yet they, start, they get demoted. And I think that is what is truly shocking. And then when you discover them, you think, um, I have to make a case for Mary Cassatt. When I wrote my first book on Mary Cassatt, most of the people said, you know, what are you working on? I'm working on this American, you know, uh, the only American impressionist who was in Paris in the, in the 1870s to the 1920s. And they said, who? And then when they had a big Mary Cassatt show in France, that in England, that, no, in America, that was trying to go to France in the 1990s, the French said, Marie qui? Like, Mary, Mary who? Uh, so we, we, this, this is a, a really crucial thing that, you know, that this, how do you live with and you'd have your history disappeared? Anyway, that's my piece about Mary Cassatt. So next is a question about um, what you said about eyes being so crucial to um, these portraits um, and how they create a sense of engagement with the viewer, um, with their gaze and how, um, so the question is about who made these original images that you're um, using as source material, were they self-portraits or were they not? Um, who is looking at those artists, women, in those original images? It's a really good question. And very often the information isn't there in later or in more recent, um, in more recent photographs, they're professional, professional photographers. They might be, uh, you know, a family or a friend snapshot. They, probably the ones that emerge to the top are ones that have um, been more widely publicized. And sometimes I keep going and going to look for just, just the right image. Um, so it's a real, there's a real diversity of gaze. And, and uh, when it, you don't know who, who the photographer is, you don't know what the relationship is, you don't know what the original eye contact is, but when you're, there's, there's a difference between a candid shot and then the, the, sort of the knowing the knowing portrait. Um, you asked a second part of the question and I don't, I lost track of it. So um, it was just about who was originally looking at the women who are being portrayed. So I guess that's... Um, okay. And sometimes I have self-portraits, um, painted self-portraits, right? You know, I can, my work is somewhat limited by, well, limited a lot by the era of photography. Um, of course, uh, there were so many artists working before that. Some of them left as self-portraits and I have worked from some painted self-portraits. Um, mm -hmm. And those, those really have, it is very different to work a drawing from a painting no matter how no matter the level of realism of, of the painting, it's very different working from painting than from a photograph. You end up with two very different results. That's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. So this question I think is 
um, probably for Griselda, and it's that Women Painters of the World was published in 1905, and Lizzie Siddle was, so I think it means maybe Painters of the World, um, yeah, was published in 1905, and Lizzie Siddle was considered one of the greats. Um, is it just later that artists, women, kind of disappeared? What decade did that take place in? Um, I, I can't answer it in sort of, I mean, it was, I think what we need to understand is the shift from the Victorian era in which even in the negative sense that they in, attributed a sphere to men and a sphere to women in their heads, they had a kind of idea that somehow men and women were very distinct beings. Uh, but because of that, they actually valued certain things that women did, right? We may not agree with the qualities they attributed to women, but in a sense, within that space, there was value. The same time in the 19th century, this is the great age of the legacy of uh, the vindication of the rights of women, the beginning of a kind of sense that women should have a different place in the world. You're going to have the major political movements of campaigns for the suffrage. So there's, there's different ways in which women were valued. Now, when you get to the beginning of the modern era, there's a, a disowning of this idea that men and women are different because people want just to have this kind of notion that I can be myself. So you'll find that women artists in the beginning of the 20th century do not want to be valued for being feminine. They wanna be able to get down to it with carving up cubism or being surrealists or whatever. So you can probably, tr there are the big cultural changes, but there you can begin to track the beginnings of the problem is that like, for instance, in the 1926, Catherine Dreyer, who had, was an artist who had a huge collection of modern art, working with Marcel Duchamp, proposed a museum of modern art, which would have been inclusive. In 1929, Alfred H. Barr begins the museum of modern art, and it's not. So I'd say in you know, the 20, that beginning of the founding of the museums of modern art, and Barr, the power of certain people in certain positions to set the, the model. So just as Janssen and Gombrich set a model for the 20th century survey history that will exclude women and exclude the possibility of thinking about issues like class and gender. So the Museum of Modern Art set the model. And in the 1930s, the late 30s when, or actually I was gonna say the 40s, Peggy Guggenheim arrives in New York in 1940 and says, you know, I want to do my gallery of, of abstract artists, surrealist, name me some women. And she can't see them being exhibited anywhere. And she says, where are they? She goes to Bar. She says, could you, she said, oh, loads of them. There's the American Abstract Artists Association. They've all been very busy. There's, here's all the names, but he did not buy a single one of them. So we have to understand this is an action. This is not, oh, I didn't know they were there or I couldn't bother to it, you know. He goes to New York or to, to Russia. He sees, you know, Rodchenko sitting opposite him is Stepanova, but he buys Rodchenko. He doesn't buy Stepanova. But in the terms of the Russians, this is a moment of, you know, revolutionary egalitarianism, men and women working side by side, fighting against power and structure. That goes. So this is, I think, a really, I, do, I can't sort of put my finger. These are not just bad men. It's a systemic creation of a different model. And then we have to not just say, here are a few women to add to it. It's a different model we're trying to create. And that's where I think going back to what Coral's doing, which is uh, what happens to us once we realize how many of them are there who are effaced, but are so firmly there, this looking back, populating this book with all these women makes you ask these big questions you're asking why were they how could this have happened that the 20th century is responsible for an annihilation you know Vasari in the 16th century has a chapter on women artists women you know Artemisa Gentileschi is the first woman to become a member of this academy in Florence but only you know very quickly she's there celebrated across the world fated by kings so I think we have to look into the history of the modern idea of this 
you know, heroic individual in, in, and this creation of a purely stylistic, purely formalist, you know, very strongly actively masculinizing set of art historians who shaped what then became the canon. Zelda, um, I've come across the idea and what do you think about the fact that this this really occurred in the wake of women getting the vote in this country and as a as a really um, sort of conscious backlash or oppression and continued on through the women women's rights movements of the 20th century yeah it is a paradox one of the greatest you know 100 years of struggle you get the vote, you become a civil being, you get the right to education. I mean, it's a much more complicated story because there's, there are women's movements in the 20th century after the vote. There's the women very much in the peace movement, women are very much in the labor movement, in the unions. You know, women are in, there's lots of women in professional organizations. Uh, we, we've lost so much of a history of what happened in the 20s and 30s. And so by the time it got to, you know, the 70s, we were sort of stranded without a memory of all these women and these writers and these composers and these artists and these architects and these designers. They're, they're all been there and they, they carried on. Um, I don't know if it's a conscious reaction. I think it's probably a deeply patriarchy, you know, was really shattered by the idea that we would suddenly all be fully part of the political world, not just in these separate spheres. Um, and it changed women's minds because many artists didn't want to have anything to do with gender because they knew this was too, too risky, right? And so they also disowned their, their relationship to a women's movement and women's struggle and women's organizations. And I just feel this, this, this whole, but crucially in the middle of the century, there is an anti-feminist fascism that is also militaristic and genocidal, but it's absorbed by the West. So the 1950s in America and Europe is infinitely more domesticating women again in their ideology. And, um, but we lost a sense of our history. And so women were stranded, I think. And as you mentioned at the very beginning, Coral, the importance of seeing um, women in museums, you know, artists are influenced by um, the works that they see in museums and the fact that uh, this model for modern museums as invented by Alfred Barr and his kind of infamous chart that um, showed the influences from one stylistic movement to another, which was exclusively male, has had such an effect on the way that museums have been over the last century. And it's only very recently, I think, that people have started to question it properly. Um, but also, as you said, Coral, it's so important to do so for the next generation. Um, this question is about why you chose portraits of the artists rather than recreating their artworks. I figure creating their artworks is really, that's that's for them to, that was, that was that was, I can't take their work <laughs> in a way. Um, I'm inspired by it and I've used it in paintings and in collages, but if I was to attempt to duplicate their work, I think it would just look like a pastiche. And, um, and again, for me, it was really important. You know, I love the work and I, you know, I love all of art history. <laughs> it's, I don't love one gender's artwork or, um, but for me, this really was, was about, um, in a way about building community and seeing who these people are and learning, learning about them was really uh, preeminent for me as a concern. Great. And then there's a question, um, about the stamps that you put on the pages, uh, the red numbered stamps and what the idea behind that is. Um, well, it sort of stands in for my signature, so I don't want to sign the fronts of all of these. Um, it also is the date stamp, because there's going to be so many of these, I want them to be able to 
have have a some kind of sense of the way that they were created. And uh, and there's also that reference to the the wonderful old rubber library stamps um, and my kind of love affair with with books and um, my my affection my affection for the old, the old library card system so all of those are a part of it so Grisel did you want to add anything to that I was just going to say I, th I think that's um it's part of the kind of very fascinating ethics of this project um and it comes back to where I wanted to start which is it takes a lot of time to do the research, to find the image, to think about the image. And then, as you say, I love this idea that, you know, you draw it for yourself at one point, even I understand you do some of the drawings in the evenings at night. And then, then this very, I mean, I think people need to appreciate how much um, skill is involved in being able to do something because you don't have a chance to correct it, right? This is your page. You've decided to put it on. and you know, when I look at it, I look at these incredible marks and how you've taken a photographic or painted image, you have discerned something in it by doing the drawing, having this relationship with the, the encounter with the woman. And then when you put it on the page, it's, it's you know, and that's why I love this picture of the, the, the brush. It's, you know, the Japanese brush, you know, when you can make it thick or when you make it thin, the inside, look at the Modus and Becker, there's a very fine set of, you know, lines and gestures, and then the washes that kind of fill it in, which are also very interesting because it's all um, on a page so that the issues of the color of skin doesn't matter. It, each one has a, a, a structure, you're not kind of marking this out. So I think the, this, this um, just, you know, it's the fact that they are on these pages speaking back in this massed, Rank. So when you have, you know, if somebody ever does the full exhibition of the 1617, it's like the, you know, the Talmudic commission, you know, mitzvot, you know, the 613 things you mustn't do, the 613 or 17 women which will be there. The, the, the power of that, you know, which is, and this is only a section. I mean, there's, there's, there's many more, obviously, you've selected. Um, I, I think that's the crucial thing to hold on to the intimacy of the relationship with which each drawing gets made and the, the technique of it, and then the sense of its accumulation. So it's more than just saying, oh, Jensen left them out. It's, it's a real reinvestigation through a woman artist of this sense of why we need to have them all part of our histories, I think so. And by, by means of not repainting them, but making them look at us. So I think that's quite a lovely note to end on. I just wanted to thank you, Griselda and Coral, for such a fascinating discussion. Lots of the comments have said how interesting it was to find out um, the background to these beautiful artworks and how enriching it is. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who attended um, and thank you to Hackleberry, um, Phil, Camilla and Sasha for, um, for coming up with the idea for this um, wonderful conversation. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank, thank you, you to much. Coral, most of all, and congratulations to Hackleberry for bringing it to London. And um, it's been a wonderful experience for me to, to get to know her and discover that she's actually a very good friend of somebody who's part of the feminist community at Leeds, studied with us at Leeds, Karen Conway. So we have to say hi to Karen, uh, who was there and feeling that uh, this is part of um, a, a very strange and exploring, you know, long lived uh, network of women who are really going to change the world by asking these questions but some of them make it by making the most wonderful drawings so thank you Coral. Thank you so much Griselda for all your kind words and the incredible value of the work you've done over the course of your life we are all better for it and thank you for taking the time to speak with me and thank you Naomi and thank you everyone at Hackleberry and thank you everyone for, for being joining us.
Great, wonderful. So, um, so yeah, we've had comments saying thank you for a wonderful conversation. Fabulous, insightful, delightful. Um, so many lovely words. <laughs> so thank you again, Coral and Griselda. Um, it's been such a joy. Great. Pleasure. Bye. Thank you, everyone.